3.5 is graphing rational functions. Tell me what the word rational means in psychology. Not crazy. All right. So we're graphing not crazy functions. Uh, what does the word rational mean in math? It's a rational number. This is not a rational number. can be written as a fraction, not a crazy fraction, and then that's where psychology and uh, math meet it. It's not a crazy fraction. The most basic rational function, the very beginner rational function, is just 1 over x. Do you happen to remember what that looks like in college algebra? Just say no, because we're going to make a table and figure it out. All right. No, I have no idea what that looks like. Well, anytime we have no idea what something looks like, we can make a table. So I went ahead, any mini mini mo, chose some x's. By the way, this is called the reciprocal function. Because that's exactly what it does. It takes the reciprocal of any number that you put in. If you put in a negative 3, what's coming out? Negative 1 third. It flips the negative three. You put in a negative two, what do you get? Negative one half. You put in a negative one, you get a negative one. What if you put in a negative one half? What's negative two. What's the reciprocal of negative one third? Negative three. What's the reciprocal of zero for 10,000 bonus points? Undefined. You can't take the reciprocal of zero. Zero in the denominator will blow a fraction up. With 5,000 bonus points, you don't even have to come back. Uh, what's the reciprocal of one third? Three, and the reciprocal of two, one half is two, and the reciprocal of one is still one. The reciprocal of two is a half, and the reciprocal of three is one third. Graph those 10 ordered pairs on that little bitty graph I gave you. Just go from negative 3 to 3 on both axes. Mine, it's my goal this semester. My personal goal is to get Samantha to use her free ring binder <laughs> and to get you to print your notes. If I accomplish nothing else this semester, but getting you to print your notes, because there's a bunch of good stuff down here you're not going to want to write down. Where your 10 points are. I can connect these five, and I can connect these five. But can I connect these five with those five? Why not? Is there a law against it? There is. Because in order to get from here to here, somewhere in there, I'd have to cross x equals 0. And we said this function is not defined at 0. So there's not a way to hook up those two pieces of the puzzle. They're going to remain two separate pieces. Um, but let's figure out what happens as your x's get smaller and smaller and smaller. Let me show you some new notation. Um, this symbol as x 
approaches negative infinity. That's how you read it, as x approaches negative infinity. That means as your x's get smaller and smaller, as we keep going this way and taking the reciprocal of negative 4, reciprocal of negative 5, way out here somewhere is going to be the reciprocal of negative 10. What are my y's getting closer and closer to? Zero. Are they ever going to be zero? No. No. So here's the notation. As x approaches negative infinity, y approaches what? Zero. What about as x approaches positive infinity? What does y approach? As x's get bigger and bigger and bigger forever to the right, y is getting closer and closer to zero again. That means that we can go past this little first point we graphed here and say as the graph gets closer and or x's get smaller and smaller and smaller, that gets closer and closer to the x-axis, but it's never going to touch the x-axis and it's never going to cross the x-axis. And the same thing to the rock. This is getting closer and closer and closer to the x-axis, but it never touches the x-axis. Here are two more symbols. As x approaches zero, and then this little negative in the air means from the left. Let's talk about as x approaches zero from the left and as x approaches zero from the right. As x approaches zero from the left means put your finger or your pencil on the left side of zero on the graph somewhere and move it in closer and closer and closer to zero. What are my y's? Where are my y's headed? I didn't mean to write that yet. Um, I, yeah, I didn't mean to write that yet. As x goes to zero from the left, where are my y's going? They're getting infinitely small. As my x's approach zero from the left, my y's are headed to negative infinity. And as x is approaching zero from the right, put your finger on the graph somewhere to the right of x equals zero and move in. Where are my y's headed? The positive infinity. Luckily, it's easy to turn a zero into an infinity. So here's what that complete graph looks like. As x approaches negative in, or x approaches negative infinity, y is approaching zero. As x approaches positive infinity, y is approaching zero. As x approaches zero from the left, y is approaching negative infinity. And as x approaches zero from the right, y is approaching positive infinity. What do you call that line that a graph gets closer and closer to, but in this case doesn't ever touch? There's a name for that in math. A line that a graph gets closer and closer to is the asymptote. The asymptote is the graph the line gets closer and closer to. So looking at this graph one more time, I could say it has a vertical asymptote. Is the y-axis, what's the equation of the y-axis? It's a vertical line, so how does the equation begin? x equals zero, x equals zero, is the fancy name for the y-axis. And it's the vertical asymptote of the reciprocal function because the, the graph is getting closer and closer to the y-axis. And then this graph also has a horizontal asymptote. And what is it? The x-axis, 
And what is the official name of the x-axis? What's the equation of the x-axis? Y equals zero because you haven't left the x-axis. All right, so that's all I want to say about that graph. Um, you can't connect the two pieces because you can't let x be zero. The horizontal asymptote is the x-axis or y equals zero. The vertical axis is the y-axis or x equals zero. Now, the same things that take other functions and shift them left, right, up, or down, or flip them upside down, can be applied to the reciprocal function. If I, let's say I subtracted two from that x before I took the reciprocal, if it was one over x minus two, that would shift the graph two to the right. If I add two after I take the reciprocal, that shifts the graph up. What if I put a negative coefficient on the 1 over x? What does that do? Flips it with respect to the x-axis, so it would be here and here instead of here and here. So all those things that we know affect the graph of a function affect the graph of 1 over x the same way. And what we're going to learn to pay attention to in each problem is what's the domain of this function because I have to watch out for what I cannot let x be. And we're going to pay attention to are there vertical asymptotes and are there horizontal asymptotes. So look at my notes on asymptotes here. The line x equals a. If it's x equals a constant, is that a vertical line or a horizontal line? x equals 7 or x equals 4. That's a vertical line. So x equals a is a vertical asymptote of the graph of the function if f of x goes to infinity or f of x goes to negative infinity what can you put in the place of f of x y i could have said if y goes to infinity or y goes to negative infinity as x approaches a i need to read that little negative up in the air from the left or x approaches a from the right. Is that, what, is that what was happening here? The y-axis is a vertical asymptote. If my y's are going either to positive infinity or negative infinity, as x approaches the, the y-axis from the left or from the right. To find the vertical asymptotes of a rational function, you just look for what makes the denominator zero. What you cannot let x be, there's going to be a vertical asymptote there. If a is a zero of the denominator, then x equals a is a vertical asymptote. For example, if this was 1 over and then x minus 2 in the denominator, I could say 2 is a zero of the denominator. 2 makes the denominator zero, so x equals 2 is a vertical asymptote. Not if that sentence makes sense. Miss Laura? Not yet? You weren't nodding, so I was. Oh, okay. All right. That's what you need to know about vertical asymptotes. They come from what makes the denominator zero. The line y equals c, what does the line y equals a constant look like? It's horizontal. So y equals c is a horizontal asymptote of the graph of the function if f of x is getting closer and closer to c as x gets infinitely big or infinitely small. And that's what was going on with this graph. As x has got infinitely small or infinitely big, my y's were getting closer and closer to zero, so y equals zero is the horizontal asymptote. To find the horizontal asymptote of a rational function, use the following guidelines. That's worth highlighting because if you come in tomorrow or Monday and say, I forgot how to find the horizontal asymptotes, I'm going to bop you on the head. I typed it for you. It's right there. Don't forget to look at it when you're doing the homework. It depends on the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator. It depends on which one is getting big fastest. If you have a fraction 
that has a bigger denominator than it has numerator? Let's say the denominator is getting bigger and bigger. Let's say the numerator stays one and the denominator gets bigger and bigger and bigger. One fourth, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh, one tenth, one one hundred, one one thousandth. What's that getting close to? Zero. So if the numerator has a lower degree than the denominator, if the bottom is getting big faster than the top, the whole thing is going to be getting closer and closer to zero. The horizontal asymptote is going to be y equals zero if the degree of the numerator is smaller than the degree of the denominator. That's a fraction whose denominator is getting big faster than the numerator. If the numerator and denominator have the same degree, there is a horizontal asymptote at the ratio of the leading coefficients. Hey, I can write you some little examples right here, just tiny, tiny. Degree of the numerator has lower degree than the degree of the denominator. That would be like if you had x squared plus four over x cubed minus three. The horizontal asymptote would be at zero because the denominator is getting big faster than the numerator. But the second one, if I had 2x squared plus 4 over 2, let's say 3x squared plus 4. The numerator and denominator are the same. The horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the leading coefficients. What the heck does that mean? What would this horizontal asymptote be? It's a fraction. What fraction? Hmm? Two thirds. Yeah, that horizontal asymptote would just be two thirds. And then if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, there is no horizontal asymptote. For example, if we had this first guy flipped upside down, x cubed minus three over x squared plus four, which is getting big faster, the numerator or denominator? Cubes get big faster than squares, so the numerator is getting big faster. Um, what happens when the top of a fraction is getting big way faster than the bottom? Let's say the denominator stays two, but the numerator goes one half, two halves, three halves, four halves, five halves, six halves. So what's going to happen to those y's? They're getting bigger and bigger. There's not a horizontal asymptote. The y's are going to just keep getting bigger and bigger, or the y's are going to keep getting smaller and smaller. So there's no horizontal asymptote. The more of this you understand and don't have to memorize, the better. Because if, when you memorize crap that doesn't make sense to you, that's when you get confused on the test. You're just trying to recall some random theorem. Oh no, what does it mean if the numerator is higher degree than the denominator? Oh no, oh no, I can't remember. But if you just think, if the top of the fraction is getting big, then the whole thing is going to get big. If the bottom of the fraction is getting big, then the whole thing is going to be getting close to zero. Remember it that way, then it's not just memorizing crap that doesn't make sense. All right, here's what we're going to look like in the homework and this is we may not even get all the way through these five examples today but this is where we're going to stop because we have um, two days to do this section here's what tonight's homework is going to look like part a b c d e f a find any vertical asymptotes and how do you find vertical asymptotes I'm just asking you to read to me because saying it out loud helps it stick. Miss Haley, how do you find vertical asymptotes? 
All right, you set the denominator equal zero. That's where vertical asymptotes come from. Miss Megan, how do you find horizontal asymptotes? This A, B, and C up here. Um, Mr. Andrew, how do you always find Y intercepts? And Mr. Jeremiah, how do you always find X intercepts? Let Y be zero. And if you're talking about a fraction, what makes a fraction zero? Or what makes a fraction equal zero? Whatever makes the top zero. So what in the A part says whatever makes the denominator zero, that's where you have vertical asymptotes. This part says whatever makes the denominator zero, those will be your X, excuse me, I said that wrong. Whatever makes your numerator zero, those will be your X intercepts. Now all of that is very self-explanatory. If you can read math, all that makes sense. The E part says if there is a horizontal asymptote, determine whether the graph crosses that horizontal asymptote. And we need to think about how that could even be possible. If, if I have, let's say, let's say I have a, horiz a vertical asymptote at negative two, can the graph possibly cross that vertical asymptote? No, why not? And that's what we cannot have. Very good. We can't let the denominator be zero so a graph can never touch its vertical asymptote. If we have a horizontal asymptote, can the graph cross it? Actually, maybe. As long as it comes back down and keeps getting closer and closer to that horizontal asymptote afterwards, a graph can actually cross its horizontal asymptote. It's just gotta either come back down to it or come back up to it in order to be the horizontal asymptote. So our first few examples, this E part isn't gonna happen. We're gonna come back to this in just a minute. Let's do a couple of very easy, straightforward examples, and then we'll find one where the graph crosses the horizontal asymptote. All right, so let's start with number 12. Page 234. In your book, it may be 233 or 235, but that's darn close. And number 12 is f of x <coughs> equals negative 3 over x plus 3. Now, we're going to follow those parts A, B, C, D, E, F. That's what I want to see in your homework. But just to kind of anticipate what's going to happen here, um, what do you think this negative coefficient is going to do to the graph? It's going to flip it. I'm going to, from now on, WRT means with respect to. So there's more, way, one, more than one way to flip a graph, but this is flip it with respect to the x-axis. That means it's going to be, instead of third quadrant and first quadrant, it's going to be flipped to second quadrant and fourth quadrant. What is this adding three? before you um, do the rest of the problem. If I gave you a value of x, you'd have to add three before you divided negative three by that number. How do you think that shifts the graph? That's your horizontal shift. The horizontal shift always works the opposite of what you might have guessed. 
So that actually um, is a horizontal shift to the left three. You don't even have to write that down in your homework or on the test. I'm just saying, I kind of know what this is going to look like already because it's my very basic reciprocal function, one over x shifted to the right three and then flipped over the x-axis. So that's the mental image I have, have in my head. But what I want to see in the homework is this. How do you find a vertical asymptote? Keep referring back to the paper until it's in your head. This is what you're going to have to do in the homework. Look at the paper. How do you find a vertical asymptote? So x plus 3 equals 0 means x equals what? Negative 3. That's why the horizontal shift works the opposite of what you expect. It's actually negative 3 that we can't let x be, not positive 3. So here's what I already know about this graph. You have to show me the asymptotes. If you don't show the asymptotes, I'm going to assume that you don't know where they are. So you put a dash line in for the asymptotes. The B part is what about horizontal asymptotes? How do you find horizontal asymptotes? Yes, Laura? In your notes. Nope. You don't have the note. Do you? Oh. you and Jeremiah go put them together. You're going to need them. It's not homework. You're going to need, need to be able to look at that paper and go, oh, that's where I look at the degree of the numerator and degree of the denominator. Is that what you were going to say? The theorem on horizontal asymptotes? Yeah. You look at the degree of the numerator. Let me write this down. Y equals negative 3 x plus 3 degree of the numerator. What's the degree of a constant? The degree of x is 1, and this doesn't have an x. I could put x to the what wouldn't change the numerator. x to the 0 wouldn't change the numerator. Any constant is of degree 0. The denominator is of degree what? So then you refer back to the theorem on horizontal asymptotes and say if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, what's the rest of that sentence? Degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, then the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. Now, if you have to look at your notes, that's okay. If you get that tattooed on your eyelid, that's okay. Or if you just think this is a fraction whose top is staying negative three, but the bottom's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the whole thing's going to be getting closer and closer to zero. That makes sense without me handing you a tight guidelines, but you need to print the guidelines. All right. Um, see, we're going to find a y-intercept. How do we always find a y-intercept? Let x be 0. f of 0 is negative 3 over 0 plus 3. What's that? That's negative 1. So the y-intercept is 0, negative 1. What about the x-intercepts? Tell me how you find an x-intercept. Put zero in for y or f of x. What makes that true? Nothing. 
Nothing. Nothing makes that true. The only way a fraction can be zero is if its numerator is zero and that numerator is negative three. That doesn't have a solution. What does that tell you about x-intercepts? It goes across the x-axis. The E part is, does the graph cross its horizontal asymptote? No. What is the horizontal asymptote? Also known as the x-axis, and we already said there are no x-intercepts. So this one's no because no x-intercepts. Another one, the answer to this part will be yes, but this one, the answer is no. And then the F part says graph the function using as few points as possible. We can always make an XY chart, a big XY chart, and use it, but our goal is to not have to do that. You're going to get faster and faster at this part, and just, you wouldn't even really look up for the second. You wouldn't have to write any of this down to go, the vertical asymptotes negative three, tick, 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 tick. Uh, horizontal asymptote zero, I can't dash in what's already solid. The y-intercept is negative one. I can tell just by looking at it. I know it doesn't cross the x-axis. And a couple more, Debbie. Here's how you learn to look at rational functions. You ask yourself, what's going on to the left of the vertical asymptote and what's going on to the right of the vertical asymptote? And do I need a test point to figure that out? To the right of the vertical asymptote, the graph can either be up here or it can be down here. Do I have that information already or do I need a test point? I have that information already because I can use that as my test point. It has to be down there to the right of the vertical asymptote. And approaching both asymptotes, it needs to approach the vertical asymptote and approach the horizontal asymptote. Now let's think about to the left of the vertical asymptote. There's the vertical asymptote. To the left of it, the graph could either be above or it could be below. Believe it or not, we're going to have some graphs where both pieces are below. So I don't automatically want to assume one is above, one is below. But I could use a test point. I could plug in on any, any, any mode. What's your favorite number to the left of three? Or negative three? Negative four? If I plug in a negative four here, is my answer positive or negative? It would be positive. That means above the x-axis. So that's the up where my other piece of the graph is. This one is easy, and we already knew it was going to look like that without doing any of this work. They're not always so easy to anticipate what is going to happen, and so that's when all this work comes in really handy. All right, let's get at least one more done. Um, next one I wanted to do was 14. We need to do it a little bit faster. Maybe we can get two done. The A part. What's the vertical asymptote? Whatever makes the denominator zero. No, whatever makes the denominator zero. And that's just five. If I copied it down right. Oh, I didn't copy it down right. Yeah. Four X over two X minus five. So the vertical asymptote is whatever makes the denominator zero, and you shouldn't really have to write that down to be able to figure out the vertical asymptotes at five halves or two and a half. 
B, horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator, which is one, is the same as the degree of the denominator, which is one, then what's the horizontal asymptote? The right the ratio of the coefficients. In this case, that would be four over two or two. Four over two, better known as two. Y equals two is a horizontal asymptote. And we're not writing down as much on this one, so you're going to have to look at your notes tonight to go, where the heck did we get two? Well, highline on the horizontal asymptote. The ratio of the numerator, if the degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator, the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of leading coefficients. C, what's the y-intercept? It's what you get when you let x be zero, and I can just look at that and see if x was zero, y would be zero. x is zero, y is zero. What about the x-intercept? That's whatever makes the top of the fraction zero. What makes the numerator zero? Zero. zero. So the x-intercept, that's the only x-intercept, and it's the same as the y-intercept. So does that change the cost? Um, the horizontal asymptote is y equals 2, and I am going to write down a little bit more on this one. The e part says, does the graph cross the horizontal asymptote y equals 2. The only way to figure out if the graph crosses the horizontal asymptote y equals 2 is to let y be 2 and see if there's a solution. If you put 2 in place of the y, you're asking, is there a solution to that equation? Let's see. To solve that equation, I'd have to clear out fractions. I'd have to clear out parentheses. I'd have to subtract 4x from both sides. Oh, never mind. I was putting it in for x. <laughs> no, don't put 2 in for x. Put 2 in for y and solve for x. Does that equation have a solution? No. Does the graph cross the horizontal asymptote? No. But sometimes when you set the function equal to whatever you got in the B part, there is a solution, and that means the graph does touch the horizontal asymptote. So the F part is this graph. There's a vertical asymptote at two and a half. There's a horizontal asymptote at Y equals two. The Y intercept is the origin. And the only x-intercept is the origin. And here's how I'm training my brain to look at the graph of rational functions. That's the only thing I'm seeing in my head. And I'm saying to the left of the vertical asymptote, the graph can either be above the horizontal or it can be below the horizontal. Do we already know, or do we have to use a test point? We already know because it's going to have to go through the origin. So below it looks like that. And then I'm going to say to the right of my ink pen, the graph can either be above the horizontal or below the horizontal. Do we already know, or are we going to have to use a test point? 
actually, there's a way we could already know that. I can still use a test point if I'm not sure, but there's already a way that I know that graph cannot be down here because what? No. There would have to be another x-intercept if the graph was below. So knowing that just keeps me from having to use a test point. And there's, not, not, there's nothing wrong with having to use a test point, but if you can get by without it, that's even better. All right, because we have three more minutes, I'm going to do one more. If you can't stay, that's okay. It will be on the video later if you want to watch one more before you start the homework. But if anybody can stay three to five more minutes, I'm going to do one more and just catch it on video. All right. So which one would I want to be my one more? Number 20. And if you have to go, I would say you probably need to watch this one on the video. But something's going to happen in number 20. It's okay. You'll get it from the video, Samantha. Don't, don't worry. Just I can already tell something's going to happen here. The thing that makes me know, oh, something special might happen here, is that denominator will factor, and it may factor into such a way that I can cancel out the factor in the numerator. And what's that going to do to the graph? All right, let's see. If I factor that denominator, it's going to factor into x plus 3 times x minus 1. This one, the special thing I thought might happen, is not going to happen because I can't cancel out the x plus 1. So it may be less important that you watch the video. <laughs> but it wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt. If you need to go, it's okay. I'm just going to finish this one for folks who can. And because I want three examples on video. You have four people in this class. <laughs> going to do it fast. Tell me what the vertical asymptotes are for that graph. Negative 3 and positive 1. Don't write numbers for vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes aren't numbers. They're equations. x equals negative 3 and x equals 1. What about horizontal asymptotes? Degree of the denominator is bigger than the degree of the numerator. The bottom's getting big faster than the top. The whole thing's going to zero. Not just a number, but the equation y equals zero. Can you tell me what the y intercept is real fast without having to write anything down? If you let x be zero, all that's going to be left of that fraction is negative one-third. So the y-intercept is zero, negative one-third. The x-intercept is whatever makes the numerator zero. What is it? So when x is negative one, y is zero. That's the x-intercept. We're getting faster and faster. The E part is, does the graph cross the horizontal asymptote? And what is the horizontal asymptote? So the question is, does the graph cross y equals 0? How can I find that out? Let y be 0. Hey, have do we already have the answer to that? We actually do, because what makes a fraction zero? If the numerator is zero and we already have, that's the x-intercept. So on this particular problem, yes, the graph crosses the horizontal asymptote at the x-intercept, because the horizontal asymptote is the x-axis. And so x equals negative 1 means 
Yes. And if I, well, I already know what y is. When x is negative one, y is zero. So that's where it crosses the horizontal asymptote. All that's left is putting this on a graph. And here's what I know. There's a vertical asymptote at negative three. There's a vertical asymptote at positive one. The horizontal asymptote is the x-axis and it's pretty difficult to put a dashed line on top of a solid line. The y-intercept is negative one-third. Oh man, I didn't tell them where to stop in the homework. Oh snap. I'll email them. I'll tell y'all that before you leave, but I'll email the other three. If you see them in another class or in the hall, tell them where, to, where we stopped. Um, the y-intercept was negative one-third. The x-intercept was negative one. And the graph crosses the horizontal asymptote at negative one zero. So I, I have all my specific points, all my asymptotes in place. Here's what I'm training my brain to see to the left and to the right of each vertical asymptote. To the left of this leftmost asymptote, to the left of my ink pen, do I know whether the graph's above or below? Is there something that makes me know or do I need to go ahead and use a test point for that? To the left of my ink pen, I don't know anything. So I need a test point, any, mini, mini, mo. I'll make me a tiny little x, y chart. Pick something to the left of negative three. If I let y be negative four, I really don't care what y is exactly. I just want to know if it's positive or negative. Think about this sign chart you could make for that. If you let x be negative four, what's the numerator? Ne and just say positive or negative, because I really don't care what the number is. x plus three would be negative, and x minus one would be negative, and when you multiply or divide three negatives, you get a what? A negative. I really don't care what the number is. I just wanted to know if the graph was above or below that x-axis, and now I know if y is negative, that piece of the graph is down here. To the right of that leftmost vertical asymptote. Um, could the graph possibly be above and coming down or could, or could it be possibly coming up or is there a way I can know that without a test point or do I need a test point? If it's got to be coming this way, why can't it be going that way? I th and there's no reason it can't be a U-turn. I think I could hit that point and come back and hit that one. I think it actually could. I can't think of any reason it couldn't be that. So I'm not sure. I'm going to use a test point, negative one. No, that's what? That's negative two. And again, I don't really care what Y is. I just want to know if it's positive or negative. So if I let y be negative two, that's gonna be a negative, that's gonna be a positive, and that's gonna be a negative. What's a negative, a positive, and a negative get when you multiply and divide? Yeah. So you were right. The graph's above the x-axis there, but I wouldn't take that for granted. We're gonna see another problem where the graph does a new turn. It's pretty clear from here what has to happen. I have to come down and hit that X or that Y intercept. It can't, look up and I'll show you what it can't do. How do I know it has to keep going down there? Why can't it be a U here? If it was a U, what would it have to do? 
there'd have to be another x-intercept. And we know there's not another x-intercept, and that's why we don't need a test point for that. So between the asymptotes, it kind of looks like negative x cubed. And then about, what about to the right of the rightmost asymptote? Do I know anything that tells me whether it has to be up here or down here? My gut says it's above, but I don't want to totally trust that. And I don't have any reason it couldn't be either one. So I'm going to pick something bigger than one, maybe uh, two. And just say if I let x be two, would y be positive or negative? That's positive, positive, positive. It would be positive, which is above the x-axis. So that's a pretty elaborate graph without a whole lot of work. The only thing that made this a lot of work is we took the time to write all this stuff down because I was going to get credit for it on the test. But if we didn't have to write all that down, you could have just looked at the original function and said it's going to have vertical asymptotes here and here, horizontal asymptote here. I could have found the x and y intercept without having to write anything down. And then just a glance at the test points and whether they gave me positive or negative y's, I could have graphed that pretty quickly if I didn't have to write all that other stuff down. And that's the goal. Alrighty. Thanks for spending an extra five minutes and giving me an audience. It's weird talking to myself, but I will if I have to. Um, I think it may help those other folks to see this. Let me tell you where to stop in your homework. Something that we haven't discussed may possibly happen, but I want you to try 11 through 27. And then if something weird does happen, we'll figure out how to deal with it one day. 11 through 27. Stop right there.